Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jamie Pennington with Moff Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session. Politics in the pandemic, where do we go from here? A conversation with Paul Keckley, which is the final part of the virtual portion of our 2022 healthcare conference. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now that we have our housekeeping video out of the way, I'm going to hand it over to Brian Connor, partner here at Mount Adams. Brian, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that introduction and welcome to everyone. Uh, as Jamie noted, this is our last session of our uh, health 2022 healthcare conference that uh, began in person uh, in Las Vegas in early November uh, and concludes uh, here today. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's so important to us in our annual healthcare conference uh, is to uh, make sure that uh, we cover the concepts of politics and policy uh, in healthcare. Uh, so we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Keckley here uh, joining us uh, for that part of our discussion for this year's conference to wrap up uh, our uh, uh, healthcare conference this year. Uh, Dr. Keckley is the managing editor of the Keckley Report and the managing partner of the Keckley Group which provides advisory services to health systems, health insurers, medical groups, uh, and healthcare investors. Dr. Keckley's an industry thought leader uh, regarding healthcare industry trends, regular, regulatory policy, emergent growth opportunities. In 2010, he facilitated negotiations uh, among his many accomplishments. Uh, in 2010, he facilitated negotiations between the White House and leading healthcare trade associations and organizations uh, pursuant to the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and is certainly considered an expert on U.S. health policies uh, specific to delivery and financing. So we're delighted to have uh, uh, Dr. Keckley, and I, I'm assuming he's going to assist, uh, insist that I call him Paul uh, here today to, <laughs> to discuss uh, our um, interesting environment in healthcare, uh, in politics and policy. And Paul, before we get started, uh, Let's let's jump to a quick polling question and kind of set the table for our discussion uh, here today uh, and get the audience involved again from a CPE perspective. Um, 
audience, do you think uh, it, we need you to answer these questions to, to get your continuing professional education? And our first one, we'll have four here today, is do you think healthcare will be a primary issue in Washington, D.C. over the next 24 months? Yes, one of the top three. Yes, but whether they move the needle for the better remains to be seen, uh, or no doubtful, or the opt-out, you have no opinion. So as a reminder, uh, click the radio button next to your preferred answer. And please uh, make sure you hit the submit button. And if you don't see that on your screen, you can expand uh, the slide portion. You should see it at the bottom. And I'll give our attendees, Paul, just a few moments to make sure uh, they get uh, um, the most opportunity to, to get their precious CPE. Very important. All right, let's take a look at what we got here. Well, I don't know if that's, uh, yeah, you, you know, we've got, uh, you know, a majority that think that healthcare is going to be an issue, uh, Paul, I guess a, a plurality saying, uh, uh, you know, which is understandable, it's an issue, but, but can uh, policy and politics ultimately move the needle, uh, which remains to be seen. Uh, so, so interesting start uh, to the discussion. Yeah. I know, um, you and I have talked about, uh, uh, you know, the November silly season uh, and, and how every two years how that impacts healthcare policy. We, of course, had the uh, Senate finalized here in the last day or so. We know it's going to be 51 49. Uh, that's going to change committee uh, assignments, et cetera. We know uh, it's going to be a split Congress. Um, your takeaways from uh, the results of the Georgia runoff election, uh, you know, as well as what happened in early November and how that might impact uh, health care policy over the next year or two. Yeah, it's really consequential. Um, when the, the Senate being kept in Democratic control allows them to appoint uh, the chair of the key committees in the Senate, uh, Senate Finance, appropriations, veterans affairs, um, and it allows them to set the agendas of those committees, and it allows them to accelerate confirmations to court appointments and to move administrative orders through the wheels of Congress faster. So what that does is it gives the Democrats a bit of an advantage in the next uh, two years. The House side, and, and by the way, on that, Brian, you've got these interesting likely uh, pairings in the committees, like the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, Help Committee, which is probably one of the two that's the most significant for health care, uh, likely going to be chaired by Bernie Sanders um, and the ranking member, uh, Rand Paul who's an ophthalmologist. So you could have some interesting fireworks in a committee like that. You've got Patty Murray moving over to probably appropriations or so it's going to be an interesting way to look at healthcare through political lens. The house side, obviously they're going to have appointments in the committees, but the real story there is going to be um, how many investigations they can launch that would tie up the agenda otherwise. And in the House, you have in the budget, ways and means and appropriations committees, uh, you've got the checkbook. So the economy is the story of the next two years, period. Um, and there will be a very strong voice from uh, a constituent base on the Republican side that says uh, spending's out of control. Uh, they're going to try to make people a little uneasy uh, by the 16th of this month when we've got a partial government shutdown, and then that'll probably handled with a, a you know a, a bit of a uh, an extension of the deadline and some money that keeps things floating, but. The economy becomes the issue going into 24. 
And where healthcare fits in that is healthcare at the federal level, when you add Medicare, the contribution to state Medicaid funds, half of the veterans budget, which is veterans health, um, you've got almost 30% of the federal government spending on healthcare. And you have these looming things. I listened to uh, Mike and Susan Tuesday, which I thought was really a great session. Um, yeah, everybody knows we've got some shortfalls and can the payroll tax sustain funding for Medicare? There are a lot bigger issues out there. A lot of folks on this call know that uh, while all this is going on, we're paying attention to the Medicare fund and everything. We've got um, a, a trillion, three hundred billion dollars in private equity dry powder that can be deployed in a market that's soft right now. Valuations are down. And even though uh, Jerome Powell's raising rates, uh, the interest costs, the added costs that you're putting on those acquisitions is offset by the fact you're paying less for them. So private equity has the momentum in this bad economy, and it's against that background where the politics of healthcare is going to be framed over the next two years. Uh, th the thing that people forget is 40% um, of the people that uh, have health insurance do not feel they're adequately insured and can't pay a $500 surprise medical bill. So it's not like health insurance has the wind at its back, but right now, most of the voters and most of the people on the Hill don't connect all these dots yet. Somehow we're still dealing with sound bites about if you've got insurance, everything's okay. And if you're in that, you know, 10% that don't, then that's a problem. Well, it's a bigger problem and we've not addressed it. And I think that's where the economy, inflation, uh, lagging GDP growth focuses the spotlight on health care. says we've got to do something with that. It's not just about fuel. It's not just about food. It's about health care. And it's hitting middle America hard. So that's a story to follow. That's interesting. Um, and, I, you know, it gets back to our first polling question where 50% of the audience thinks, uh, as you alluded to, it's going to be an issue, but can we get anything done uh, related to that? You, uh, you mentioned the dry powder and private equity. Uh, we've heard some uh, discussion previous uh, in previous sessions for our healthcare conference, uh, you know, about uh, insurance companies and the quote unquote dry powder that insurance companies have. I mean, they've done. Uh, if anybody's done well uh, in the pandemic, it's the insurance companies. Do you see? that dry powder, whether it's pri private equity, uh, the, uh, the, the potential spending power that the insurance companies have, moving the needle on reimbursement, uh, assuming that um, the macroeconomic issues uh, that we'll be dealing with at, and economic issues uh, overall we'll be dealing with as a country may uh, limit or prohibit movement of government reimbursement rates as uh, Mike and Susan's discussions seem to uh, indicate, uh, or should providers be expecting that uh, the rate environment, if it's status quo, that's a good thing. It's either staying the same or going down. Well, um, you'd have to bifurcate the health insurance market to answer that question. If you take uh, the top dozen or so where the United, Humana, Cygnus, uh, Evelyn's and others are, you assume that the rule uh, the Blues now have, which is they're able to compete across state lines, that's fairly recent. Just three months ago, the courts ruled that they can't be constrained to operate just in their state. So you expect some of the better financed Blues to become strong national players. Um, so the stronger balance sheet, uh, scalable plans will absolutely uh, pursue a strategy of uh, compression of their reimbursement as aggressively as they can, 
pushing reference pricing into their discussions with large employers, um, and at the same time, uh, diversify. You saw um, Andrew Witte um, last week announcing his five objectives for United uh, that they're going to be an integrated health system. They're going to be in the delivery and financing of health care. So they're diversifying. They'll fund a lot of their diversification by paying providers less. And that will separate some of the stronger financed plans from the rest. And what we forget is, in terms of numbers of insurers, there are many, many more insurers that are small or community-based plans. Uh, but in terms of total enrollment, 80% of the enrollment is right now in the hands of the 36 blues and six other plans. So you see this separation of big and financed and strong versus other. That'll also open the door to a lot of M&A, a a lot of these plans being acquired, again, acquired at a lower cost. Um, And I think the plan says, uh, it's not surprising, the United, they employ 64,000 doctors right now. They operate their own urgent care clinics. They've got their own clinical research organizations. And they're targeted in how they do that. So the people on this call in, you know, on, in Washington State could see it very readily, but you're not going to see it in Ohio yet. So I'm watching in the health insurance sector um, flex its muscles uh, at the expense of providers and at the expense of prescription drugs through their very aggressive formularies, um, and doing that so as to compete with what might become of um, Walmart healthcare, or Amazon healthcare, or Google healthcare, and we don't know what that is at all. We just know that they are spending a lot of money. Yeah, interesting. I, from your perspective, if uh, you know, we expect government reimbursement rates uh, to uh, not a lot of movement there, certainly in a positive direction, uh, based on the factors uh, that we talked about. Um, what about uh, the um, prospects for uh, further stimulus? Uh, I know, you know, obviously um, the macro economic inflation issues and the split Congress uh, probably limit uh, those opportunities. There's an interesting study in the Wall Street Journal that came out, I don't know if I'd say study or uh, opinion piece uh, that that talked about where the initial stimulus funds went from a provider perspective and whether that was appropriate. Is there any, in the tea leaves, any opportunities for struggling providers out there to see government stimulus over the next couple of years? It will be targeted. Uh, It'll be targeted more directly to um, health systems that serve underserved populations that can demonstrate that. The big uh, miss on the first round of stimulus emergency funds was it was predicated on revenues. Uh, Had nothing to do with how you operated or where you operate or the markets that you're in. The The data shows very clearly that where a hospital operates, if you're trying to pick one factor uh, to predict a bottom line, it's where are you selling your services? If you're selling it in a market where um, utilization is reasonably moderate and price elasticity is pretty high and you're not getting pressured by the health insurance industry, you can do okay. So um, there will be stimulus available for some of the uh, Medicare dependent hospitals, but they're gonna calibrate that toward Medicare dependence uh, with a lot of emphasis on dual eligibles, Medicare and Medicaid eligible. Uh, Just using the number that are above 65 is not a good measure. They're gonna carve out certain um, communities in which they can attach stimulus for broadband and infrastructure, which is already funded. That's in the Infrastructure uh, Act, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that they've already passed. 
so they can attach the two. So they'll add on to some of the broadband funding and infrastructure funding to support some providers that are going to be uh, in line for that kind of need. But uh, across the board, no. Uh, it's the, the Congress, the committees, uh, they're still scratching their head. How could some hospitals have done well during the pandemic? And how could so many others not do well? And now why are the big not-for-profit systems uh, like the common spirits or the uh, ascensions of the world reporting uh, this year uh, billion dollar operating losses when just two years ago they had non-operating income from their investment portfolios that were pretty impressive. So there's a lot of head scratching in D.C. Anytime um, Congress on either side of the aisle um, is confused about something, it's easier not to do anything. That's, that's, that's a less painful response. Uh, and if you, you know, they'll typically say, well, we need to set up a task force to study this, or we'll do this, or we'll do that. That's just a way to push it down the road. So I think we've got a couple of segments on the provider side uh, that have a pretty good story to tell right now where there is some modest stimulus funding available. Um, and where it can be attached to investments already in place, uh, like the infrastructure bill. Um, if you follow all that, that means most hospitals know. But if you're rural and in a, a difficult market in terms of demography, or uh, if you're in a medically underserved area uh, where uh, the nursing home population experienced uh, high levels of COVID death, the mortality rate was high. Yeah, stimulus would it be would be available, and I'll just add this thing, Brian. Everything about healthcare, uh, the attention that we've given it, the the reason we say we've been beaten up uh, is workforce shortage uh, and the travelers' cost, and what it's costing us to have a nurse come in for a day. Uh, a win in the world of politics is to go after that and say, so really the problem was the fact that you had some gouging going on by a few bad actors. So you can win your next election cycle if you say, we've really zeroed in not on a scorched earth. We're not going to bail out hospitals. It really wasn't the hospitals. It was these greedy guys that came in with their travelers programs and milk the hospitals dry. And that's the reason we're having to prop them up right now. So, so watch that. You'll see campaign ads about that. That's really interesting. Do you, do you see that as a particular partisan issue or is that both sides of the aisle will, will lean on that? I'm glad you said that. You know, the interesting thing about healthcare, if you look at the, all the exit polls and everything in this last cycle, uh, Health care was 10th on the overall issue list, but abortion was a top three issue. So we kind of separated abortion, access to women's rights, Dobbs versus uh, Jackson Health decision from the rest of health care. And we say, well, health care, you know, and yet everybody said it's the economy and jobs and inflation that's killing us. So we didn't attach health care to inflation and jobs. Um, and then second, we didn't attach abortion to as a health care issue. So I think that'll be an adjustment that's made because, uh, ironically, the public, Republican, Democrat, Independent, are not particularly savvy about health care. They uh, don't give it a standing O. Uh, the studies that Gallup and Pew and others have done say that um, the lack of transparency of prices, the complexity of the system, the poor customer service, is seen as uh, kind of universally the case. So it's not Republican or Democratic yet. There's not a, an issue other than abortion rights that separates the two parties today. If you remember in the 2010 election cycle, it was the Affordable Care Act. 
and uh, the Obama folks uh, lost 63 seats in the House campaigning on, you know, ACA is government-run health care. Well, it was abortion in this cycle. It didn't really pop as the difference maker except to uh, a lot of uh, young urban women. But in the 24 cycle, I think when you attach affordability of health care with inflation, with depression of housing, and with continued problems in the food supply chain, healthcare is going to get more attention, and it's going to be healthcare affordability. And that's where these, all these things come back to roost. Affordability issues favor Republicans. Uh, accessibility issues favor Democrats. But neither party really brought those home in this last, last cycle. We'll, we, and I guess we'll see. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Well, and that's, a, I think, a great segue uh, to our next polling question and to uh, shift gears, the concept of affordability. Uh, our second polling question, uh, what's the likelihood uh, for the audience here that Congress will impose stricter price controls for, we specify hospital services, we can make that uh, general as well. Uh, for our audience, do you think Congress will step in uh, on the price side uh, a, very likely, B, not likely, or C, not sure. Uh, for our audience, uh, please select the radio button on the left for your answer and make sure you hit submit. And I'll remind you, we do have a Q&A feature here in the console. Uh, so if you have questions uh, for Paul, please submit those um, into the Q&A feature. I'll have an opportunity to, to cycle through those. And, and uh, to the extent that we have an opportunity, we'll get those uh, asked. We'll give you a few moments here to make sure we get uh, the majority of our attendees the opportunity to participate. Let's take a look Paul, at what our audience thinks. Uh, so they don't have a lot of confidence in uh, Congress, at least the uh, United States legislature, being able to uh, or interested and inclined to deal with an issue of price controls or, you know, getting back to the concept of affordability. One, do you agree with that? And two, what what would be another uh, or other mechanisms that the federal government over the next couple of years might uh, use, levers that they can pull uh, to address cost, affordability, price control kind of issues? Is that FTC and, and merger activity? Are there others? Or do you think legislation can can happen that uh, or will happen that 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 will affect the, that issue? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of uh, levers that at a federal level can be pulled, whether it's um, the anti consolidation activity at the DOJ and the FTC, or uh, would you create a national formulary for uh, accessing drugs or this or that. Uh, the short answer to this question is it's unlikely the federal government's going to do anything about hospital price controls. Um, however, it is highly likely that states will. So the, the big uh, transition, and really this starts in the, uh, in the midterm and, and before, uh, the paralysis of Congress, its inability to really look at a cogent policy for the health system, systemness in healthcare, connecting public health with healthcare services. So the debacle we had with the COVID uh, testing activity could have been simpler. Remember, it's very interesting if you reflect, uh, the government decided it needed to go to retail pharmacies rather than hospitals and clinics to distribute testing because they knew this thing was just so whacked out. Um, but what it did was it exposed all these weaknesses and then allowed uh, governors to say, I'm not gonna wait on this. So we already have um, eight states that have uh, legislation to put some kind of control on drug prices. 
where you have um, a state commission that has to approve paying more than 10 percent, uh, a greater than 10 percent increase in the uh, average wholesale price for the drug unless it's approved by the state, by a control board. And that terrifies the uh, prescription drug industry because they've been accustomed to going to CMS and kind of getting their approvals. Now you've got to go state by state. Can the same be true of hospital prices? Absolutely. Um, Maryland uh, was one place where they had rate controls. Governors, blue and red, recognized that the unit prices for prescription drugs and for a day in the hospital is the root cause of the system's uh, cost spiral. It's, it's the unit cost of that day in the hospital or of that prescription drug. So yeah, there would be efforts at the state level to do that, and here's where the politics jumps in. If it's a red state, um, it's highly unlikely because a Republican says price control is not free market. Uh, if it's a blue state, it's a matter of how far do you go, how fast do you go, how aggressive can you be? And you're going to see a flurry of that activity over the next 36 months. Um, and that's where to watch. Uh, the price control stuff is going to be topical. We haven't talked about the, uh, the other rule is the price transparency rule for health insurance plans, uh, which kicked in July of 22. Um, the effect of that is yet to be seen. We're still going to watch that. So all the Moss Adams world is going to be paying attention to more stories about uh, transparency and price controls and state by state differences. So your your clients that operate in multiple states is going to get a little complicated, but that's reality because the federal government's going to be kind of paralyzed. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, the health insurance transparency rules, uh, of course, for providers. Uh, there were transparency rules that were put in place that, you know, those those are one of the uh, the, trans the transparency rules uh, on providers and requirements for disclosure, et cetera. Right. One of the few things or that concept of transparency seems to be one of the few things that translates across administration. Uh, it might have been a Trump administration policy. The Biden administration is charging ahead with that. I don't know that yeah. we've seen for that, you know, the initial provider transparency kind of activity, a lot of needle moving. Uh, but do you think that that's something that uh, is is has the potential to continue to kind of garner um, bipartisan uh, support and ultimately on a on a federal level, uh, you know, continue to get some traction, be a needle mover, or, or is that also something that will be pushed down to the states? No, it's real. It'll allow the states to do more, and it would allow the states um, to say for the commercial population or for the individual population buying insurance through uh, .gov or other parts of the insurance market, use the transparency rule as a starting point and go beyond. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely a big deal. Um, the, uh, the response, you, your observation was spot on. That was an executive order uh, that the Trump folks brought out and the Biden people kept it purposely. And the only thing they did was take advantage of the fact that most hospitals paid no attention to it. And so they just said, we're not charging enough. A hundred dollars a day for a violation, that's not enough. It needs to be in the millions. So they bumped up the penalty and kept the policy. And now suddenly you've got two out of three hospitals in the country that are at some level of compliance. But prior to that, <laughs> no harm, no foul, right? Pay a hundred bucks and spend your money on your other CapEx requirements. Uh, states have more latitude around hospital prices than they realize. 
most governors don't really realize that you don't have to wait for Medicare. There are things that they can do. That's interesting. Do you, from a, just to, to continue to pull the transparency thread, do you, do you think the, the regulations um, that have been put in place could, could potentially be put in place around transparency is the ultimate intent or the lever there to allow consumers to make uh, and patients and, and users of the healthcare system to make better decisions to control prices? Or will that ultimately be a regulatory lever where states or federal government, other uh, uh, government organizations will look at this data and say, we have to do something from a regulatory perspective to control pricing? Yeah, it's the latter. The, 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 the concept that the consumer is going to pay attention to prices and is therefore going to change their behavior uh, based on prices that are available through a machine-readable format for 300 shoppable services was kind of a moonshot. Um, <laughs> it's, it sounds really great. Right. Uh, we had previous uh, types of pricing stuff out there in states like California and others where fewer than 2% of the population ever paid attention to it because there's a whole lot of things between you and a price that determines what you're going to do and when you're going to do it, uh, your insurance programs and this and that. Uh, but on the latter, yeah, um, does the notion of having prices accessible in real time uh, available to anybody, could that translate into policies requiring individuals who didn't click the app to check the price for an elective service? Could it mean they pay more out of pocket as a result? Or the whole premise of reference pricing, which is uh, the notion that uh, you have to compare costs not just in your local community, but you can compare the price for, you know, total joint to uh, somebody in North Carolina or somebody in Texas. Um, the ability to have both the insurance and the hospital price transparency enables policy setting to evolve that says uh, judicious purchasing of healthcare services um, needs to be compared outside a conventional um, model of it's this CPT code. It needs to be compared across total cost of care and it needs to accumulate these codes so that you arrive at comparisons of apples to apples. And that's the journey we're on. Is that gonna happen? Yeah, it's gonna happen. That's the big bet um, that the Amazons of the world are making, the Microsofts of the world are making. That's the reason Google is putting such investment in its um, cloud so that they can house that and distribute that data. Microsoft's doing the same thing. So it's a long game. The price transparency rule is kind of a step toward that. Just as uh, 10 years ago, when we started the meaningful use journey, we said everybody needs to use an electronic health record. Well, that wasn't something anybody in the healthcare industry wanted, but the system said you can't operate uh, in a closet and just expect us to keep paying for everything. We've got to have access to data. It has to be comparable. It has to be meta tagged. We have to have a standard language. And ironically, during the downturn of 08, 09, 010, monies for uh, HIT and interoperability didn't go away. They continued. So that's kind of everybody within the Moss Adams world has to, at, at a point, step back and say, it, it's not about the story de jour. It's not about the CMS announcement on, you know, uh, today they had an announcement about some uh, streamlining of pre-auth. That's fine. That's great. Look at the long game. Where's the system going? 
And are all these puzzle pieces coming together to tell us where it will end up? And I think that's the story. Yeah, fascinating. Before, uh, Paul, before we move off this this price control um, topic, an interesting question here from the audience uh, that I wanted to throw. You. And, you know, we've talked about uh, price control in a number of ways. And, and when you talk about inputs into the system, you talked about you know the hot button topic, drug pricing, et cetera. The question from the audience regarding price controls, is there any lobbying or activity happening to implement price controls on goods and services that providers much per, must purchase. Uh, so other aspects of the supply chain, when you ta start talking about, uh, you know, equipment, uh, sure. other kinds of items outside of drug prices, do, do you see that being something that, that will be on the list either from a federal or state perspective? Yes. Uh, I'm going to put that in the context of the day after tomorrow. Uh -huh. First steps are to be able to have access to that data, which we're getting in place, and much more pressure on GPOs and much more disclosure of deals cut and things like that. Step two of that is to enable legislation that allows uh, for certain elements of a supply chain, certain capital costs to become uh, in a band of total cost of care. That's acceptable. Outside that band, then you got to pay the difference. So is the employer going to say, you know, if you want to go use their program, which embedded in it is here's the cost of uh, all of the disposables, which is all the band-aids and stuff that are incorporated, or here's what they're appropriating as the cost of a day in the hospital in a med surge unit with an acuity level of 2.0. All of those ingredients cook into a total cost of care model. And then a purchaser develops their benefit design around that total cost of care and then give people options of paying more if they choose. Yeah. That's the evolution of all that. And, and you're really pointing to something important. And you're going to see this in the prescription drug industry. Uh, big time kind of uh, Shia Sunni fights between who's really embedded in the cost of a drug and, and what the manufacturers are screaming right now is, look, it's not us. Manufacturing bears some responsibility, but look at all the middlemen that get in the middle of this, the PBMs, the managed care companies, the retail pharmacies. So by the time you see what something costs, it has nothing to do with what we charge. That's food fights, right? Within the supply chain, the food fights that'll play out, we're going to this total cost of care model. That's the only way for us to compare apples to apples. And embedded in that are all those elements in the cost of that, fixed and direct, the calculus for each. And then if you want more than that, fine, go for it. Yeah, and that starts to get into you know, the concept where I think we're seeing a little bit more flexibility from uh, the public on, you know, the concept of steerage and narrow yeah. networks. As you start to talk about price control, those kinds of things come into play. And I think we've come a long ways from, uh, you know, I want to keep my doctor uh, and have all my choices to where maybe, you know, the public's a little bit more open. Uh, if we're going to get some affordability um, results out of this to, to be have their choices narrowed. Yeah, yeah. If you're a data geek, uh, we use conjoint analysis to compare uh, the difference between what people say and what they do, and how much value they ascribe to one option versus other in a purchase decision. Healthcare is incredibly uh, separated between what people say they want and what they will actually do because we've never really managed this as a true market. We're a B2B industry. We're not a B2C industry. So we're going to make this transition, you know, slowly. And over time, we'll start to see relationships between what people do and what they prefer. But right now, they're off the chart different. You know, I'd love to drive, you know, the highest end Mercedes that you can get. But um, I'd rather get a two-year-old, uh, you know, Chevy right now. That's what I can afford. Understood. 
Well, let's shift gears again. Uh, and, and to do that, uh, we'll go to our third polling question here for the audience. Uh, and that's what's the likelihood CMS will impose uh, restrictions in the next two years. Uh, and we, we use the term CMS, uh, let's use it generally as, as the uh, federal government or perhaps at the state level, will government impose restrictions in the next two years on private equity investments in healthcare? A, very likely, B, not likely, uh, or C, not sure. So uh, audience, if you could uh, uh, select the answer that uh, best represents your view and hit submit, uh, we'd appreciate that. And just uh, to uh, remind the audience that uh, we'll have an announcement here at the end of our session on uh, CPE certificates and, and how you get those um, in addition to information on uh, recording of the session, et cetera. Uh, so let's give the audience just a few more moments. Uh, they only have three answers here, Paul, but they're being very deliberate on this. Uh -huh. that's, that's what we love as a conscientious uh, group here. Let's take a look uh, at what they think. So they think the government is is not likely to intercede substantively on uh, private equity investment in healthcare. I'm not sure I agree with that. I'm, I'm curious as to whether you do, but as a as an intro into the topic, uh, you talked about the dry powder that's sitting on the sidelines uh, in the private equity space uh, that would be available to the healthcare industry. Uh, you know, wh where do you see that uh, shaking out and, and how does private equity influence and impact uh, the healthcare industry uh, over the next couple of years? Uh, significant impact uh, because the dry powder is there that uh, others don't have. Um, will there be some um, restrictions on the maneuverability of private equity and health services, health care provider services? Um, yeah, I don't think it'll be specific to health care. I think you'll hear about two uh, discussions with private equity. One is uh, carried interest and the degree to which, you know, we need to be uh, taxing the uh, GP's proceeds differently than they get taxed right now. Um, I don't think it'll be adjusted much, but I think that would have some political favor. Um, and Even second, on both sides of the aisle with a split Congress, do you think that there is well, some momentum or potentially an yeah. appetite for those kinds of the, tweaks? The, the, yeah, the fact that it is both sides of the aisle means it can't be a big, big number, a big, big right. bump up. But it means that you can say at this point where the uh, Treasury is running short of funds and we got to come with some, come up with some offsets, whether it's some of these rural uh, stimulus packages or whatever, I can see that. Uh, and the second is uh, the hold periods. I think there's growing uh, discussion specific to health care investments and specific to hospitals, post-acute facilities, uh, not so much physician practices right now, that perhaps uh, there should be a minimum hold period of five years or six years. Uh, and as everybody you know, on your uh, call would know, uh, it's slightly south of that right now when a private equity fund acquires and then flips it and they're flipping it to another sponsor, another fund. So could a incremental uh, tweaking of the advantage that private equity has that has some optical uh, advantage politically be those two things, bumping up that carried interest and in, um, perhaps extending um, ownership to a another year or to at least five years or something i think that will be in the bowels of the machinery that drives health care we were talking at the very beginning about congress and how it operates this starts in a subcommittee <laughs> it starts uh probably not in the help committee where you're really thinking about programs probably starts over here in the appropriations and budget committee where they're trying to figure out how to pay for stuff. Uh, so yeah, but it's not going to be scorched earth. 
private equity, uh, whether we like it or not, whether it feels right or not, is 55% of the new capital flows in the system. So, you know, it's going to be hard to walk away from that. Do you see, we have an interesting question here, Paul, in the, uh, uh, from the audience in the Q&A, uh, a question, I don't know if it's a question, combination question slash accusation. Why is there no discussion on the pre preventative aspect of healthcare costs versus oh. maintenance, maintenance management? Do you see private equity as a significant influencer in that, do you, it, 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 uh, um, investments of that nature on uh, wellness, pre preventative care, et yeah. cetera, is that appealing to, to, to private well, equity? And do you see private equity investing in that? Or is private equity largely looking to capitalize on uh, existing system mechanisms uh, that are appealing? They are making big investments in quote, preventive, but it's called um, kind of this whole person primary care model in which um, physical and mental health, prophylactic dentistry, ophthalmic care, nutrition, uh, and even a, a prescription benefit are embedded in one um, business model. And this is what private equity is funding in the forms of the chin meds and the ioras and the privias of the world and here's the bet they're betting that a primary care centric organization of those activities in a capitated environment will dramatically reduce cost associated with hospital care emergency room services even expensive uh, level three and four drugs so private equity is making its bet that that front door, that kind of gatekeeping system will be in place. That's what they envision as the value uh, strategy of the future. That's where value can be created in the system. There are all kinds of models to do it. Uh, but what's clear is no one believes that a physical medicine only primary care physician only model of preventive health is good enough. It has to be something different and better. Um, and I think that's getting some legs. There's some parts of the country where that's already showing some pretty significant opportunity. I'll just add this. Um, it has to be as appealing to the privately insured populations as it is to the Medicare populations. If, if we basically build that model just for a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, we're going to miss the opportunity. The Gen Y crowd, some of the younger millennials, there's much more opportunity for coordinated, uh, enhanced primary care than we uh, have seen. And I think private equity is making some bets to do that. Let's get, Paul, to our, our last polling question here. Make sure we get that in, uh, and that'll set the stage for some uh, conclusive discussions here or concluding discussions. Uh, and for the audience, our uh, last polling question for you today, what's the likelihood that voters in 2024, uh, as we come up on our uh, next election cycle, that seems a long ways away and in some ways seems like it's right around the corner, uh, will consider health care affordability as the primary reason? Uh, for their vote, very likely, not likely, or not sure. And again, you probably have this figured out at this point, but uh, select your answer by clicking on the radio button uh, next to the choices and or the appropriate choice and make sure you hit submit. You got to hit submit for uh, your answer to register. And this will conclude our polling. So for those of you that have answered at least three or four, uh, you will get your uh, CP credit uh, for this session. It'd be interesting, Paul, I think, to see, uh, you know, this gets back to the question that we asked initially is, are we, you know, healthcare is, is, is likely to be a topic. It was strange that, you know, it was number 10 right. on the list recently. Yeah. It's usually a topic, but you never know if it's a needle mover. 
uh, for, for voters and in policy discussion. Uh, and I'd be interested to see what uh, our audience thinks here. And then, you know, interesting to see what you think uh, over the next couple of years and going into the 24 election cycle, uh, if you think healthcare is going to be, uh, you know, a needle mover or do we just have other issues and all of the issues in healthcare just kind of get kicked around uh, as we deal with other things. Let's take a look at uh, what the audience selected. Not likely. Again, the audience doesn't have a lot of confidence uh, given the current <laughs> makeup that uh, uh, in 24, uh, <laughs> with all the stuff that uh, gets talked about in the news cycle, that uh, healthcare affordability is going to be the primary reason uh, for their vote. I'm wondering, uh, Paul, if you think that that's going to be in the top three, and if we're going to, you know, again, if we're going to see the, the needle move uh, in the next couple of years to, to get to that point. I think it will be, uh, but I would change uh, health care affordability to uh, inflation, and everybody would have said for sure. And what we've yeah. not done is show the relationship between uh, medical care and discretionary spending on medical care vis-a-vis -vis housing, food, and fuel. Uh, in the last CPI report that comes out of uh, BLS, uh, medical services prices trailing 12 months was third uh, behind food and fuel, and that's increase. So, yeah, I think it'll be an issue, but uh, <laughs> as this question's asked, I would have agreed with the people that said not, not very likely, but if it's now inflation and every day we're hearing about what's hitting the household, it's your out-of-pocket cost, for your health care, it's fuel cost. Uh, by the way, your uh, rent has gone up. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be part of the trifecta, and we're going to hear a lot about it. And you think, uh, hence your prediction, is inflation is going to be as big a topic in the 24 election cycle that it is right now and that it was in our November election cycle here uh, a month I ago. Do. I do. And, and that's, you know, with the caveat, unless we're at war with Russia uh, or China um, and you always let's, balance. let's hope we're talking about inflation. then. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I've gone through this for, you know, almost 40 years now. Um, the public's uh, psyche moves depending on news cycles and uh, the urgency of something. Um, it's amazing how fast you come together after a 9-11 and how quickly that dissipates. So uh, I think by 24, you're talking about this is a campaign cycle that started this week, right? It started today. Now we know the Senate. Now we're talking about is Biden running, is DeSantis running, and what's Trump going to do? It's already started. The timing of inflation and inflationary spikes relative to other world events will answer this question. Well, I think that's, that's well said. And uh, as we uh, get to the end of our, our presentation here, I, uh, Paul, I'd like to thank you for a, a thoughtful uh, discussion and, and a great conclusion to our 2022 uh, healthcare conference series. Uh, and uh, I, I we haven't asked you this directly, Paul, but I'm, I'm guessing that uh, uh, the, for our audience, uh, questions that we didn't get to, uh, the opportunity to reach out to you uh, directly is there. We'll pass along your, your yeah, uh, information yeah. to the Keckley Group. And thank sure. you so much for your, your time and your insight here today. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. And with that, thank you to the audience. We appreciate uh, your engagement as we close out. Uh, the 22 uh, healthcare conference uh, season, I'll call it, with our last virtual session. And to close this session here today, I'll turn it back over uh, to Jamie. Thank you, Brian and Paul, for a great session today. To our attendees, if you have met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will also be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console.
Finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. We would appreciate your feedback to help plan future events. Thank you for joining our webcast. This does conclude our 2022 healthcare conference. We hope that you'll be able to join us for future events. Take care, everyone.